Okay, so the, what we're presenting here, we've called the uh, political parties eligibility criteria and women's political representation. It's uh, somewhat different from the title that's up there, but uh, it's it's really it's it's part of the same uh, project. Uh, this work that we're presenting here is uh, within a, a larger project, ongoing project on gender and political recruitment, more more broadly. Uh, that's uh, getting towards its end, I guess. Uh, next year we should we should finish sometime. Uh, and this project deals uh, broadly with with uh, issues then of how political parties and the manner in which they select candidates has an effect on on the number of male and female uh, candidates. And in particular, in this project, we're <coughs> we're looking at both formal and informal procedures and to what extent they're consequences than our gender. Uh, and we're using mixed methods, uh, not within this particular paper, but within the, the project as a whole. Uh, I've talked about before, for those of you who were at Kuji, we, we um, presented a part of this project as well that deals with a, with a GEPAL data on Latin American countries. Uh, here we're uh, analyzing data from International IDEA. Uh, we've also worked on papers which is more of a kind of medium N, where we looked at all the parties of the world who have quotas <coughs> us for both women and other minorities and, and compare them. And we're also working on some case study uh, material, in particular on, on Tanzania and Kenya right now. Uh, but also looking to do at least, at least one more uh, case study on these issues. Because of course, when, when you get to Actually, both both formal and informal procedures, and informal in particular, it's it's really difficult to, to get comparative data. Uh, so, so although we have decided in this project that we're going to try, we're going to see how how far we can go, uh, how much there is, and what you can do with it. Uh, we also recognize that it probably you probably only can go so far. We also need at least to to complement it and look look more in depth at at different cases. Um, but some of the gaps that, that kind of got us uh, going uh, has to do with the fact that this thing called candidate selection is still often referred to as the secret garden politics. It was called that in, um, in the 1980s and it's still very much true. It's, it's difficult to research because the processes are processes that political parties generally don't want people to know too, too much about. Very central decisions uh, for the political parties uh, have to do with who they consider to be a suitable candidate. Uh, so although there are uh, formal regulations, there are a lot of other things going on as well. <coughs> and there is um, a huge lack of comparative data on parties in general, actually. I mean, most, most studies we see deal either with, with country-level differences. If we look at gender representations, we often see you know, what countries have reached the highest level rather than uh, what type of parties. Uh, and if we look at candidate selection, of course, this, this lack of comparative data is, is even more pronounced than, than when it comes to parties. What has been done has um, been biased towards Western parties, the comparative data that we have, and thus the knowledge that we have produced and that we try to apply to all the other cases are based on what's going on in, in Western Europe and the US to a large extent. Uh, and very often in this research uh, we emphasize and we hear about the gendered potential consequences of formal and informal procedures but there's still quite uh, little research done on the particular consequences of formal and, and informal rules. So in particular, the, <coughs> for the project as a whole, we've been, we're searching for ways to kind of look at the interaction between formal and informal rules and how they, they work in, in political parties. And that, uh, with this data, the idea data that we use here, that we'll get back to later, uh, has a part that deals with uh, informal criteria as well and, and our, what we set out to do when we came here was really to investigate whether we could use those aspects that dealt with informal criteria on candidate selection and we tried and we tried and we tried and we just finally decided that we don't we didn't really believe uh, that particular data that dealt with um, what what 
priorities and what informal criteria party officials say they apply when they select candidates. We just didn't think that the that the, the data made any sense. So at a quite late stage, uh, we decided instead to look at the, the formal criteria that you that you see here, uh, that we feel are much more easy to determine. You either have them in, in a document or you or you don't. They're easy to double check if we don't if we want to double check the idea data. It's fairly easy at least to it's easier to uh, find party documents, although they're not always readily available either. Uh, <coughs> But perhaps most importantly, the, it's also, I think, uh, easier to, to, to understand, at least in most of these cases, what, what the people were asked in the survey and what they meant by it, whereas in the case of the informal criteria, this was quite often uh, a problem. So this is just to say that uh, this is, um, I mean, we've been thinking about these issues for a long time, but as uh, an analysis, this is quite late when we decided <coughs> that we just would not work with the informal criteria anymore. Uh, we were, uh, well, our deadline was in a, in, a, in a very short time ahead of us. So this is the first draft. Uh, all comments welcome, but, but uh, just so you know, that's where we're coming from. And this particular uh, paper then, very, very broadly, I think, addresses the question of, well, who, who participates? Uh, in a political regime. Uh, and we know more, I think, and there's more research about the kind of the issues about who, who votes, who participates at that level, uh, who has suffrage, which is pointed out, of course, in, in uh, constitutions and election laws, but also uh, research on within the project as well, turnout, you know, not only the formal requirements for who's allowed to vote, but also who actually does turn out to vote and, who, and what affects that. What we're looking at here is then instead what, what affects who stands for office. Uh, and I mean, f formally, usually at least at the same time that, that women are, are given suffrage, they're also given the right to, to, um, to stand for office. Uh, so, so you can look around and, and see in uh, constitutions and election laws as well uh, who is eligible for uh, for office, who can become a candidate. Uh, often in constitutions what you will see are uh, requirements that, deal, that are quite general, that deal more with you have to be above 18 of age or whatever, or you uh, have to be a citizen of this country. Um, the more specific criteria, although you can find them in constitutions sometimes as well, but more often you will find them in the, in the party's own internal regulations, stipulating who they want to see as a candidate. Uh, what their candidate should should be like. So we are looking then here at, at party criteria that, that may or may not affect men and women differently. <coughs> <coughs> so when we look at, at these uh, eligibility criteria, uh, within the, the context of, of candidate selection literature, we move, I think, from what has been a focus on the decision making in the candidate selection process to more specific criteria that the political parties set up to, to delimit the, the pool of eligibles to start with, uh, in a sense. Um, before, the, the field has focused and the, a large emphasis is put on, on uh, how to characterize the processes and, and, and what uh, consequences that may have for, for who ends up as a, as a candidate. Uh, it deals with where the decisions about candidature is taken, if it's the political party leadership or whether it's taken by branches, so it deals with, le with issues of centralization and, and decentralization. It deals with issues of, of methods for selection, whether there's a vote, whether there's a primary. Um, so, the, so the who and where and, and how of the, of the actual process by which parties select candidates have been in focus. What we're, what we're doing here is, is really then focusing on the step before that. Uh, and I haven't seen a lot of, of research on that step before that and how that actually then uh, affects uh, the pool of, of aspirants. Because in this literature, you, you, we still <coughs> see a, a lot of references to, to a, a useful distinction, I think, between, between supply on the one side and, and demand on the other side that at least helps us to, to 
to uh, think about, okay, what, what are we looking at here? Are we looking at either um, the, the pool of aspirants that parties have to choose from? Is it the case that women just don't step forward, that political parties do not have that many women to choose from? Or is it the case that it's the, in, it's the demand factors, uh, that political parties want a certain kind of candidates and that, uh, they, and that, that has, a, has a gendered uh, consequence as well? When, when we look at these factors, this distinction seems to be somewhat blurred because, because what political parties are doing is that they're ahead of the process, are kind of telling everyone what kind of candidate they want, which will, of course, then also already delimit the, the, the type of person who steps forward as a candidate. Um, so we are looking uh, not first and foremost on, on you know, the direct consequences of uh, rules that specifically say that women can't stand for election, although I'm, I'm sure there are a few of those parties left in the world, but there are not that many. So we're instead looking at indirect uh, rules and how they may affect candidates. So what has been said about, about rules and, and gender in, in this context? If we look very broadly, not just in parties, but in, in uh, all kinds of work on equal opportunities, in uh, academia or in management or whatever, you generally hear that rules are, are women's best friends. Women, in order to advance, need a rule-bounded process. They need to know which rules to adhere to, they need to know what, uh, what the criteria are for entering the contest, and they also need to know uh, if they feel unjustly treated, they have to be able to go back to rules, to be able to say that I want to appeal uh, this decision based on this particular rule. So you very often find this as a, as a recommendation across the board, but also in, in, uh, in research on political parties, that women fare better in, in rule-bound parties because it is then easier for outsiders such as women, but probably also other uh, politically marginalized groups to understand what it actually takes to become a candidate. And if you still don't become a candidate, it's easier to know on what grounds to appeal. Um, the other side of this, of this argument uh, has to do with the fact that informality tends to favor at least some men. Uh, research has shown as well that there's a stronger male dominance in, in informal patronage-based parties, uh, although across the board it's kind of difficult to, uh, to measure. There are case studies uh, showing this, and, and generally this argument would be then that it's it's easier for gatekeepers to arbitrarily select members from their own networks or people they perceive to be like themselves if they do not have a, have a firm set of, set of rules uh, to abide by. In my own research, uh, for instance, I, I have shown how, how clientelism, which is very clearly a, an informal institution in a sense, uh, how, how political networks that are already male-dominated uh, how, how that informal institution then kind of feeds back into political parties because they are able to choose people they uh, trust and they're able to choose, choose people who have uh, access to, to the resources they need to distribute uh, in, in these plantless networks. So without being, you know, specific uh, gendered uh, rule, there are implications of the practices that are going on in that case. But then it's of course a question, is it you know, the fact that there are rules or there are no rules, or is it the, the content of rules? What do the rules say? What do the rules stipulate? Um, if, if, we, if we look around, we can probably find a lot of uh, examples of where informal practices actually favor women. There's research showing, for instance, that, uh, that uh, many women in party leaderships will, will lead to more women in the political parties. We can look at the, uh, the political relatives in, in Asia where a lot of women come to power because they are the widow of a famous political figure or the daughter of a famous political figure, something that of course is not you know, written down in party documents that has to de deal, do with informal practices that, that in some sense can, uh, under certain circumstances, then favor women. Of course, we can also think of formal rules that very directly uh, are bad for women. You, you can formalize discrimination of, of women, and as you know, 
constitutions have done, at least until very recently, where women have not been given the, the right to vote or send for office. That is a very clear rule, but of course it's commonsensical in a sense that it's not uh, good for female participation. Um, so as, as others too have pointed out, uh, rules may be devoid of explicit references to gender and still rely on norms that exclude certain groups. So we're not, we're not interested in looking at the, at the rules because there are probably very few that directly uh, discriminate women, but rather to see what the consequences there may be of, of rules that are seemingly uh, gender neutral. So based on this then, the expectations uh, we have on, on formal rules is that just the existence of formal selection criteria uh, do not in and by themselves impact the representation of women and that any impact we find, whether positive or negative, of formal criteria is dependent on the content of selection rules uh, and in particular then the, the expectation we, we had when we started looking at, at these criteria is that criteria that benefit members of an already ruling male-dominated elite uh, indirectly also disfavor women who are generally not part of that. Okay. Good. So I'm going to explain a little bit about the data and the approach we had, the empirical approach. So um, we looked at part of the data that IDEA was uh, collecting. Uh, I think from the beginning it was something like 170 political parties, but but for these things that we are interested in, uh, there was a bit uh, fewer parts to look at. So we looked altogether at 105 political parties in 33 countries in Africa, in Asia, and in post-communist Europe. Uh, so uh, and among those, I would say that the fewest ones are the European ones, and then they are more like equally spread out when it comes to the Asian and the African. And this data that idea, international idea was collected, uh, <coughs> collection took place in 2005 and 2006. Uh, and they asked a whole bunch of questions, of which ones we look at uh, a few of them then. And then, um, combining that data, we also collected our own data. And uh, so we looked at the number of women representatives uh, in these countries. Uh, by political party. So distinguishing between different parties, we looked at uh, the number of, of women within the party parliamentary group in the election that was following after the data collection. And uh, so that is basically our, our dependent variable. And ideally we would have liked to, to collect data on the candidate level because then voters would not be able to, to have an impact on who actually then, then uh, become selected. But um, within these uh, kinds of countries, it, it, it was hard enough just to get uh, data on, on the representatives at the party level. To get it at candidacy level, it's, it, I mean, you might do it for a case study or like a comparative case study, but to, to do it on like 30 countries, it would be, it would require, um, yeah, not, not two persons working on, on <laughs> such a project, but, but a whole much, a whole lot more. So, but it's uh, it's something we can discuss with with uh, perhaps international idea or someone else in the future because it would make research easier. For sure. Anyway, we looked at four eligibility eligibility criteria, uh, and we I think we excluded from one for age and so on because it was a bit. Uh, it could be in the in the electoral laws and so on. So we, we look at four of them, and these are our independent variables. And so the first one is on, on party position, and it is a requirement that in order to to be uh, eligible, you have to have a certain party position within the uh, certain position within the party, like a certain formal uh, position. So not anyone can can just uh, try to to. Uh, to when stand for election, but you have to have a certain position. And then the second criteria is formal qualifications, such as, as uh, level of education, so to speak. The third one is, is related to, to the background of a person when it comes to ethnic background uh, or, or geographic background. So, so it's more uh, that kind of, of uh, limitation, so to speak. Uh, 
And the fourth one uh, is related to, to what kind of support base perhaps you have in, in, uh, in the community and so on, uh, which is related to, to uh, collecting signatures. So you need a certain number of signatures uh, to, to be able to, to run for office. And um, what we did then, based on these four criteria, we first, if we're, in order to look at uh, the impact of, of these rules as such, without looking at the content, we, we created an, an index ranging from, from zero to four, depending on how many of these, how many of these criteria you had. And uh, to give an idea, uh, these criteria range is more or less from like 17, 18% up to I think about 40 was, if, I, if I'm not wrong, 40% was, was the maximum. So, so within that range was, was uh, uh, the, the percentage of parties <coughs> that had these kinds of, of criteria. So that was the index for, for looking at the rules as such. And then also we, we looked at the content and then we went into to look more specifically on, on these four or criteria. So our strategy that then was to, like I was mentioning before, to look at the elections uh, following the collection of the idea uh, data. So elections then took place uh, between 2006 and 2011, depending on, on which country. And uh, for for the OS regressions that we ran, we had some control variables as well. Uh, at the party level, we looked at the party age. What could have an impact on on the, which, on the number of criteria you have, and also on, on we looked at party quotas. And then at the national level, we had look at, we looked at the democracy level of democracy, but also democracy squared uh, because of this tendency that we've seen in in uh, recent research that the number of women uh, seems to be highest within authoritarian regimes and in the more democratic ones, and least within the semi-democratic countries. Uh, and then you also look at socioeconomic development and level of corruption, electoral system, and uh, whether the country has electoral gen or so uh, So that's basically the, the, the model that we, that we used. Yeah, I'm not gonna, this one is in, in the paper for those of you that but I'm going to focus not on every one of these, but more look at, at uh, the criteria that we, that we uh, So the model, the first model looks more at the index to, to analyze the impact of, of these uh, criteria as such without looking at the content. And uh, whereas model two to five was more at each specific criteria. And, and I'm going to go a little bit deeper into, into each of them later on, but as you can see, uh, the dependent variables uh, the level of women. So, so you can see that there's a negative relationship to, to, to women for, for each of these. Uh, but there's statistical significance in some of them and not in others. So I'm going to go a little bit into the, so, so starting with the eligibility <coughs> index we have, uh, there seems to be uh, a negative relationship with women's political representation. So about 2.4 percentage points uh, fewer women for, for each additional criteria. And we have this linear, linear idea. Later on we can perhaps think about losing that. Anyway, and then, uh, so, so what we find here is that in, in by, by having this, running this analysis, you can see that the former rules actually may, may benefit male aspirants. And this is uh, a little bit in contrast to what, what uh, thoughts have been in, in, in the research on gender candidate recruitment that have really uh, emphasized a lot on, on the importance of rules for women and so on. So, the, uh, so having this finding, we were interested then to look at if these results were driven by one or two criteria, or are former rules bad for women, like, in general, so to speak. And when we look at the content of the rules, each criteria at the time, 
Um, we find that a requirement to have a specific hardware system is negatively related, related to women's representation. Almost 70% of women, if you have that, that kind of, of uh, requirements. So, and we, we interpret this by, by thinking in terms of, of, of power within the political parties and uh, that these kind of these kinds of criteria in, in political parties such as the one we're interested in here in the African nation and, and uh, post-communist European countries uh, women in, in general lack like a strong strong uh, power base within within these within these parties uh, so so if you have few women uh, fewer women on top positions within the political parties these kinds of requirements will will be uh, harmful to women. Uh, in contrast, for example, uh, if you would run this kind of analysis, for example, on the Nordic countries or so, <coughs> where women are more stronger within the political parties, perhaps you wouldn't have these kinds of gender consequences. So I think in, in this case, it's, it's related to, to uh, who, who are the strongest ones within the political parties, and therefore you might have gender consequences sometimes or not. And these most of uh, the democratic countries, so to speak, that we were interested in, uh, we find it just. Moving then to the geographic or ethnic requirement, we also see a negative relationship that is specifically significant to women's political representation. It's about 6 percentage points fewer women in this case. And in this case, we, we interpret this finding by, by, by thinking in terms of, of uh, competition between different kinds of cleavages and in in uh, whenever for example in, in the case of ethnicity when when political parties are emphasizing those kinds of of, uh, of uh, cleavages and identities it might be harmful to to other ones to other kinds of identities and you see in these kinds of, of uh, findings in, in in some previous research we are mentioning Holmes and most in 2010 which looked at the, the number of women in ethnic parties, so to speak. I also read uh, last week a uh, paper in, in the, I think, the last issue of AGPS, and they looked at uh, ethnicity and, and women when it comes to, to ministerial positions in Africa, and you saw more or less the same kind of pattern here. So when you emphasize one cleavage, uh, other ones might be, be downside, so to speak. So that's more or less our... our Interpretation at this stage, and then for the uh, last two, for the for the formal requirements such as education and so on, and, and signatures, we don't find any <coughs> significant uh, relationships. So it seems to be that women are as skilled as men when it comes to formal skills, so to speak, and they also seem to have some kind of support base and local connections. So when those when you have those requirements, it's, you don't find any any <coughs> consequences. So, if we conclude then, uh, what we find here and what we focus on here is the, the unintended gendered consequences of party rules. So we, we find that some party rules that are seemingly gender neutral, uh, they indeed have, have intended uh, impacts. And uh, <coughs> so political party eligibility criteria, they are not always gender neutral, they actually might shape women's chances to be selected. And here we, we for this finding we have, we mostly focus on the content of the rules. So you have to go into the, which kinds of rules do you have, and uh, and how, how if at all, are they, are they gendered, so to speak. So the idea here is that by going back to the basic requirements about who, who may actually run for office, uh, and we have to expand the research agenda to not only look at <coughs> the decision-making process on, on candidate selection, such as uh, decentralization, centralization, or the size of the selection and so on, but also look at these basic uh, criteria for who may stand for election in the first place. And uh, it's also uh, a call to think about also in terms of, of electoral constraints in, in a more broader way that uh, you might have that for the electorates uh, that we have in, in many countries, 
but that but there is also these kinds of constraints uh, regarding who may stand for us. So, so we have to take those things into account uh, in these selected expenses. So that's pretty much it. Sorry for the talk for the I think there will be time for comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Harry. And uh, now for discussing, would you like to add anything? Do you want to? Yeah, I can, I can sit there. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, uh, discussing Helen and Pear's paper will be um, Dr. Anna Boucher, lecturer here in the department. Okay, well thanks for the paper, I really enjoyed it. And I actually have limited material to critique. It's more, I have a few ideas about how, many, how perhaps you could expand the theoretical discussion towards the end of the paper. Um, and I think this paper is really interesting because it looks at this mismatch between formal criteria um, and, uh, sorry, formal criteria and, and outcomes. So this challenges this assumption which you present as fairly standard, not just in the electoral scholarship, but in a, a whole lot of other areas came from the presentation that rules assist women. But I was wondering, you, you talked about the struggle that you had with your, your informal paper yeah. and the mismatch. I think that in itself reveals something really interesting. The people are not accurately um, citing the reasons for informal selection and perhaps there might actually be something in that, in, in a way in that non-finding, yeah. um, but perhaps not in a quantitative sense, maybe for your field work and some of the case studies that you mentioned. But the, the, um, the contribution that you make here to challenging what is what appears to be from your paper an assumption in the scholarship and investigating it empirically I think is really significant. Um, so I come as a non-electoral studies person, so if any of my comments are a bit naive, please forgive me. Um, the idea data set, um, so the way that you present it, you're looking mainly at the non-Western countries and some post-communist European countries. I think for someone um, who's perhaps coming from a gender perspective and doesn't know about this data set, it would be useful to know why you're not looking at Western European countries. This is simply not included. Is there a way to include it? It came out in Paz analysis towards the end that perhaps there would be variation in those countries that whilst they're, you make clear that they're overstudied, that, for instance, you've mentioned Scandinavian countries that where women have a larger support base, that these uh, findings might not be apparent. So it would seem to me that to avoid any sort of selection bias, it might be useful to include those countries if possible. Um, and I just, it, it's, to me, it came from a little bit, perhaps there was an assumption underpinning that that the Western countries are done and dusted, but perhaps they're not. I mean, the, the, actually, the, the scholarship you refer to largely focuses, from what I understand, on Western countries, mm -hmm. and yet you're making an important challenge to that as well. So it would strike me that it's actually really, it would be really interesting to look at the Western countries as well, whilst acknowledging the Western bias in the scholarship and the contributions of looking at non-Western countries, especially for the ethnic cleavage dimension that you mentioned. Okay, so in terms of what you find is statistically significant, um, as you mentioned, the party position and the geographic ethnic background. And here I think that there's a broader feminist scholarship which you could which you start to bring in which you could bring in more in your paper. So looking at the party position, um, I think what's really interesting about that is you show that depending on the nature of formal rules, they can actually benefit existing informal networks, i.e. male networks and networks of male privilege. And I think here there's a scholarship on how male privilege plays out in the workplace, um, which could be really useful to look at. Um, it might be also what's happening here. So in a way, informality is coming into formal rules. Um, and this is also scholarship that looks at sort of promotion rates of men versus women, why men might be promoted faster, because despite the fact that promotion rules are seemingly formal and objective, that there are informal processes that can play into the operation of those rules. Um, and looking at the interaction of formal rules and informal rules, when you look at your model two, um, once you control for uh, party position, the statistical significance of gender quota laws drops off. So the positive effect of gender quota laws drops off, unlike in the other models. So it will be interesting to explore, perhaps, if um, the ex if this could be a separate paper, actually, the existence of gender quota laws has to be buttressed by other gender equality principles, including these kind of um, formal rules within political parties. So that's something that just mm. I just noticed, mm. and I thought was really interesting. Mm. 
Um, with regard to the, because the significance of gene decoders is strongly positive otherwise. Um, with regard to geographic ethnic background, um, as you noted, this is statistically significant and it has a negative effect upon eligibility for women. Um, and you raise the argument of the centrality of ethnic cleavages in new political parties over gender. So I wonder if it would be interesting perhaps to explore differentiating between those parties where ethnic identity is relevant and where it's not. Again, given my, this is not my area of expertise, but whether party manif uh, manifesto scholarship allows you to do that or data sets. Um, I mean, you mentioned that you control for party quotas, and I'm assuming some of those quotas are on an ethnic basis as well as a gender basis. But I wonder if there's perhaps some other scholarship which allows you to, outside of Western nations, where I know that scholarship exists, um, which allows you to explore that a bit more, how um, parties might be built up around um, this central ethnic cleavage, especially in some of these new emerging democracies, as you mentioned in the paper. Um, and is there an argument around the necessity to focus on ethnic claims in the context of party building that you could draw out in a little bit more detail? I'm sure that exists in the scholarship. It's interesting to note that, in the neg that the negative effect of a majoritarian system is strongest as a control under the fourth model. And this would seem to suggest that the necessity to identify with the central ethnic traits to the detriment of other ideologies might be stronger in systems that do, uh, do not su support um, parties based on ethnic cleavages that have a more centralising effect, as we know, is the case with the majoritarian electoral systems. So it might be, that's another argument to sort of drill down a, li a little bit more. It is possible empirically, um, and I don't know if it is. Uh, and you mentioned some of your other work, Ellen, on clientelistic dimensions, and um, that doesn't look in the paper, so that seems, that seems to only support your argument. Perhaps you cite it, you don't discuss it. So that would be useful to look at in more detail as well. Uh, but for more from a feminist perspective, I think there's really interesting scholarship on intersectionality. That uh, you, your sub subheading is in something about intersectionality, but you don't actually bring in that scholarship that much in the discussion. Um, on whether there is a kind of competition occurring here between ethnicity and gender that um, is irreconcilable, or whether the two can somehow be reconciled, especially in my area, immigration. It's a lot of this um, stuff in the European context, some from Abiela Sims um, and Phillips. There's a recent issue in gender and politics. So that's all relevant because there's actually a really interesting finding here about trade-offs, um, but applying it to a, to a non, non, um, new, newly emerging and um, non-Western context. So, and just finally, in, in terms of the way that you frame the whole, your whole uh, finding, I mean, I think in a sense what you're finding is that within formal rules there are degrees of informality. So you find actually that education and signature sign-off, a number of signatures, I'm not sure what the measure is there, um, actually don't have a negative effect, whereas the party position and the, um, the ethnicity do. And I just think perhaps rather than saying, well, mm, it appears that the supply demand scholarship is, is wrong, what might actually be here is it provides further support for it because the rules, are for, they're formal rules, but they, they, they capture informal dimensions, in particular the role of networks and patronage. Mm -hmm. and, and so that might be a way that you could sell it that is quite nuanced and mm -hmm. actually seems to support your finding. Um, and is consistent with what we know about rules is that when we look at the subsidy of operation of rules, they can actually have these kind of discriminatory effects, as you, as you know. So I thought it was a really great paper. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. you can have my comments. <laughs>